Welcome back to Understanding Python. My name is Jake, and today I'll be teaching you about exceptions and how to use try except blocks. Understanding exceptions and how to handle them is an essential tool for all Python programmers. Mastering these will not only help you understand what is happening when something breaks, but also allow you to write more robust programs. As we go, if you learned something new, let me know by liking the video. Now, let's get started. First, let's start off by explaining what exceptions are and what they aren't. Exceptions are errors that are encountered while you're running a program, and they differ from syntax errors, which are errors that the compiler encounters when trying to compile your program. What do I mean by this? Let's give an example in our file. This example will say, if one is equal to three, return true. And you'll see right now VS Code is complaining because it notices a closing parenthesis there and there is no opening parenthesis. So let's save it and try to run it. And here we see we have a syntax error. This actually occurred before anything was compiled. And by Python's design, it gives you a good idea of where that error occurred. We see we have our syntax error, unmatched, closed parentheses, and the output above has a little caret pointing to the unmatched parentheses. Depending on formatting, these can sometimes be off a little bit in position, but it should be pretty accurate down to the line where it happens. Now I said this happens before the program runs, which we can demonstrate if we were to print something before it. So let's save it and try to run it again. Here we see that it never got to that print statement because again, Python tries to compile everything before it actually runs it. This is different than a normal exception in which the program is actually running when the error is encountered. So if we were to switch this up and say a is equal to five divided by zero, and try to run that, we'll see we did get our print message here saying starting and then our traceback with our exception. The exception type being a zero division error letting us know that we can't divide by zero. This is an example of an exception. Zero division error is one of the built-in exception classes that Python provides. We can see that it is a subclass of the main exception class. By running this is subclass line. All additional built-in exceptions that you see are built on top of this base exception class. And you can do the same for yours, which we'll be demonstrating a little bit later. But before we do that, let's show you how you can handle the exceptions within your program. In Python, we do that with the try except block. So kind of like you do with an if else statement, we'll say try, and then we'll go next line under and over. And then this is where we're gonna try our risky code. And the risky code in this case, again, will be that zero division error. And then we can say, except if an exception is triggered under that try block, then we can catch it here. Once we catch an exception, we can decide what we want to do with it. For this simple example, we're just going to say an exception occurred because we have a pretty good idea of what it was, but we haven't added specifics to catch a particular kind of exception. So let's run this. And we see instead of getting that zero division error, we print out an exception occurred. This is nice. However, it's not very helpful. As a general rule, you don't want to have blank except statements. You want to be more specific about what you're trying to catch. So let's modify this example and add a little bit more syntax to this. We can say except zero division error. And now, we're sure that if we get underneath this zero division error block, then we just caught someone trying to divide by zero. So we can print out, you tried to divide by zero. There we go. It's good to be specific about the kind of errors that you catch, because if something is raised deeper down within your program or in a dependent library, something that you haven't thought about before, then you want to let that exception continue to raise up. You should really only catch specific errors. For example, if we modify this again and make that code good now, 
and try to do something that would result in another exception being raised, say trying to cast a string a into an integer, that's not going to be caught by the zero division error. In fact, if we run this, you see that it gets raised as a value error. And the message included in that says invalid literal for int with base 10 and the value being passed in is a. So it can't convert a into a base 10 integer. Now, if this is something that we do want to handle as well, we can modify our accept clause to also account for that. And that was a value error. And this time we're going to add a little bit more syntax because we want to make the feedback more valuable. We're going to say accept value error as error. This is going to store that value error object into the variable error, which means we can do something with it. So we can now give back a little bit more custom feedback. So for this feedback, we'll try to give a message like, you didn't give me an integer. And we'll put a colon and then put error down here as well. So let's run that. So now when we see that run, you see our message, you didn't give me an integer with the actual message that was provided within the value error. That's quite a bit more helpful. And it's a good general rule to follow for anything that is a non-trivial exception. All right, let's move back to our file. We can get rid of these. Okay, so say you wanted to make a script that acted as a simple calculator. What you likely want to do is have some type of continuous loop that will ask for user input, do some kind of calculation, and then return the result. So let's set up the baseline for that right now. We'll start off with a little print statement. We'll set a variable running to true. And say while running, we're going to do something. And the very basis of this will be getting a value from the user. So we'll say to calc or to calculate equal to input and a little prompt message we'll put there will just be a pound sign and a space. We'll store the result, which will be calculated by a helper method that we'll do later because we don't want to include all of the logic within this. We'll pass in our two calc value. And then finally, we'll try to print the result. So there's a few areas where we could potentially run into an issue. The first is going to be receiving user input because while the script's waiting, the user can decide that they want to hit control C to stop the script, which would raise a keyboard interrupt exception. So that'll be the first one that we handle. So let's make a new try statement and wrap both of these under that. And we'll handle that keyboard interrupt, except keyboard interrupt. So at this point, we can just say, make a little new line here, goodbye to the user, and set running equal to false. So this will be the new accepted way that the user stops the script by simply hitting control C. We'll catch the exception at line 12. We'll print out the message, set running equals to false. It will continue on and hit this print statement. And because it's going to hit this print statement, which isn't something that we actually want it to do, we can add an additional piece of syntax to try accept. And that is else. And wrap print under that. So what else does is it runs additional statements if an exception is not caught. So if both of these run perfectly fine, we're not going to run this piece of code. We're going to hit else and then print out the results. Perfect. And if this exception is caught, we're going to print out goodbye and skip the else altogether. So we don't try to print out a result that we previously stored. So the three keywords I've introduced with try except so far are try, accept, and else. Okay. So the next thing we need to put in place is our do calc method. So this will be a nice little helper method that we're going to put together up top here. It's going to take in our to calc value. Well, we're going to store it internally as calc expression because it's expecting it to be an expression. 
and I realized I tried to capitalize five, which of course doesn't work. So this is what our expression is going to look like. It's going to be some kind of integer, a space, and then the operation, another space, and then the final integer there. So let's write out the basic logic of that. Okay, so right now, the logic reads as this. We're going to split the expression into its separate parts. So we're going to have the left value, the right value, and the operation. Then we have some conditional flow down here, saying if the operation is a plus sign, then we're going to add them together and return the result. Same for minus, multiply, and divide. However, we still have to do a few more things. So we need to explicitly convert left into an integer. Same thing with right. But right now, this helper method is pretty naive. Because what would happen if we tried to split a non-properly spaced expression into three parts? Well, let's find out. So we'll have left, op, and right is equal to our expression. First, we'll start with the good version, dot split. Now we have left, we have op, and we have right. That's working exactly as expected. However, if we were to modify this and remove that space there and try it again, we have a value error. It's another exception. Not enough values to unpack. Expected three, got two. So we need to wrap this in a try and accept. And we're going to accept explicitly for a value error. Now, we don't really want to raise a value error, but we do want to give some kind of feedback to that while loop to let them know that some kind of user error happened. So for now, let's put a pass statement and then define a new user error exception. And this is really easy to do. We'll just say class user error, which inherits from exception, and we can just put a simple pass statement here. That's just a very loose wrapper. Now we have a new user error exception class that we can raise within our program. So let's try that now. We're going to explicitly raise a user error. And in here, we're going to give some kind of helpful text saying something like, make sure there's one space between each element. So now we are raising an exception, which means that we're creating the exception and passing it up to whatever called us or whatever is above us in the call chain. In this example, what's above us is this piece of code right here. So now we have a new exception that we need to handle. So we'll add that in here now. Accept user error as error. And in here, we're simply just going to go ahead and print out the error itself. We don't need to do anything fancy since we already gave a pretty helpful message before. Okay, so let's return back up to our helper function. Now, you may have already seen an issue that we could encounter with these two right here. And that is, what if someone gives in a value that can't be converted into an integer? Well, that's another type of exception that we could potentially encounter. So we'll have to wrap these in their own try accepts as well. So we're gonna say try, left equals int left, except this should be a value error as well. We can verify. Yep, it is a value error. So again, except value error. This time we do want to store the message that comes in. And then instead of just raising a normal user error, we can be more specific to the type of error that we give back. Let's just throw a little pass statement in there real quick. And we're actually going to create a new type of exception. This one is going to be called a user value error, which will inherit from user error. Now, since user error is just a thin wrapper around exception, we could just inherit from exception. But this better shows that you can chain exception classes as well without having any kind of issue. Now, instead of just doing a pass statement, we can modify the init method of user value error. So its usage will be a little bit different. 
So in here, we'll do our def init, which of course takes self. And I'll also take a variable called bad val. We're going to say self.message. This could be whatever you want. Is equal to, and we'll do a little f string here, and then just say bad val in kind of inner quotes can't be converted to an integer. And it would help if I used a curly brace there so I don't have a syntax error. Okay, now we have a new user value error exception class that we can use within our helper function. So instead of having to type that error message each time, we can just raise a user value error and pass in left as the bad value. That's automatically going to format that message as left can't be converted to an integer. Of course, it'll be the value of left. And then we'll do the same thing for right here as well. So we'll just copy this code and change left to right. Okay, perfect. So you might be asking why I stored value error as error when I'm not using it. Well, we're going to add another piece of syntax to this raise statement. If you want to give a bit more context as to where the error is coming from when you're using your custom errors, you can say raise and then whatever the exception class is, and then say from error. So we're raising a user value error from this error. And we'll see what that looks like in a little bit. We'll do the same thing down here. So let's give a bit more context in the trace back. It'll give you the value error, and then above that, it's going to say something along the lines of user value error, curd, while handling the value error. Okay, so we have one last thing to handle in our helper function, and that is what if someone tries to pass in an operation that isn't plus, minus, multiply, or divide, or basically anything else in between? We'll put an else statement here, and we're going to raise a new user error. This time saying that the operation is not a supported operation. Beautiful. So now we're handling a number of possible cases that the user can do things wrong. So if they don't have correct spacing in their expression, we're going to go ahead and handle that and raise this user error, letting them know to have one space between each element. If they give us incorrect values for either the left or the right, then we're going to raise exceptions for that. And finally, if they give us an invalid operator, we can raise that user error as well. So these are things that we can either choose to handle or not handle within our loop. Okay, so let's add in this new user value error exception. So we'll say accept user value error as well, let's stay consistent with error. And then we can just say print error.message because that's where we're storing the actual message of the error. We'll also need to handle a possible zero division error, just like we did before. And just print out something like, I'm not willing to divide by zero. Okay. I think we're good to start testing this. So let's try it out. Okay, we see our initial message. Enter a space separated expression. Example, five times seven. So let's start with a simple one. One plus two. And we get three as a result. Beautiful. Four times six. 24. Now let's start messing around with it and see what happens with it. We'll start with the zero division. Five divided by zero. It says, I'm not willing to divide by zero. No exceptions raised, just gives you valuable feedback. And if we say something like a plus six, we got something interesting here. Give us back a. Now, why could that be? Because the user value error is supposed to print out a specific message, but it looks like we're getting a different kind of behavior. It looks like we're getting the behavior here. And this is because of the way that Python exceptions work 
it will always handle the exceptions from top to bottom. And while user value error is the more correct error to use, user value error inherits from user error. And because of the way that Python sees this, it will look up the exceptions chain and see if any of those could apply in a previous chain. So if we were to do a base accept and then the exception class above this, that will be handled, well, with the correct indentation, that would be handled even before that. So if you have something that inherits from another one or is a more specific error message, you want to include that above the more general error message. So let's control C out of there. Oh, we saw our little goodbye message there because again, we're handling that keyboard interrupt. And let's run this again. This time we're gonna say A plus five. And now we get our user value error message. A can't be converted into an integer. Perfect. So let's try out a few of our other ones. Let's try the spacing example, one plus two. And it says, make sure there's one space between each element. Perfect. I think we've tried all the cases that we've defined within this little script here. So it's pretty robust. And the way that it is robust is that we've thought of a number of possible scenarios where a user could give us incorrect input and then handle them by using try and accept. And also gave a little bit more valuable feedback to our main running loop with custom exceptions. But before we stop, I want to show you what that raise from syntax looks like. And in order to do that, I'm going to introduce another concept, raise. Now raise is useful if you don't want to modify the chain where an exception is being called from. So you just want to make sure that you catch the exception, possibly do something before you raise the exception back up. But raise will just raise whatever exception it encountered straight back up the call chain. Let's try this. A plus five. All right, let's give us a little bit more room so we can see what's going on here. And with Python tracebacks, you're always gonna wanna start from the bottom and work your way up. We see that we had a user value error raised, and that came from this particular line saying raise user value error left from error, which further up the call chain was a result of calling do calc. And then up here, we can see what happens when we included that from value error. It says the above exception was the direct cause of the following exception. So the above exception is that value error here, saying invalid literal for int with base 10a. So if you want to give your users more context as to where an exception happened, you can use this raise from syntax. In the meantime, we're going to revert this back to its previous state. We're not going to raise it. We're going to continue to handle it. And then introduce the last piece of syntax for try except. We already have try. We have except. We have else. Remember that else happens when you don't encounter an exception. And then there is finally. So finally is going to run every single time, no matter what happens. So this is typically where people put some type of cleanup code where if an exception is encountered and you want to exit the program you can do your cleanup and finally and then exit you can put important logic in the finally clause if you want to make sure that no matter what happens this particular code runs so let's take a look at that five divided by two we get our answer 2.5 and then we see running finally. And if we say five divided by zero, you see I'm not willing to divide by zero, running finally. If we hit control C, we see goodbye, and then running finally. So keep finally in mind if you need to do some type of cleanup. But right now, our little script is running fine. It's a good little calculator. So we'll wrap up this video. Now that you understand exceptions and try accept, you can handle anything thrown your way. What is your favorite use of exceptions and try accept? Or was it something I showed today? 
leave a comment down below to let me know. As always, today's code will be added to the understanding GitHub repo, so check the description for a link. And of course, if you have any questions or suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover, leave a comment for me. To keep up with this series, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.